Soil health. Um, I'm not sure if we defined it this morning or not. Sorry, I missed the morning. It is the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. Uh, it's the continued part that I think is, is the thing that's starting to concern us or elude us. Um, soil, is, uh, soil is one of those things that, that uh, I mean, you just inherently know what are the good farms and the poor farms or, or a farm that always does well or a farm that just, you know, regardless of whether it gets dry or hot or warm or soft, you know, it, it just always seems to do well. And part of that is because of soil health. And, and so, you know, we got to ask ourselves, okay, what is it? Is it something we can buy in a jug or is it something we can, you know, get in a seed or as a, you know, as a treatment or anything like that? And, and basically the answer is no. But, but in, practical, in practical terms, I'm going to ask you, do you remember taking pasture, oat pasture for navy beans? Like I can remember years ago, I mean, guys would crawl across a mile of broken glass to rent a farm that, you know, would come out of pasture and they'd, you know, give it about three years of edible beans in the first five because edibles always did well on it. I mean, maybe didn't really know why, but they always did well on it. Remember taking, or remember the corn that a good alfalfa sod would grow. I mean, so if you're, if you have, uh, if you have forages and stuff, you've left that forage down for three or four years, and corn always really seems to do well on it, and everybody always thought it was the nutrients, you know, it must be the nitrogen that the alfalfa, you know, uh, had fixed. And I say no. Uh, remember the corn that's three feet taller where the fence came up, you know, so you consolidate a farm or whatever, and you can always see that, for about the first five years, you can see that strip where the fence came out, and it always is about three feet taller, and, and, and really sexy stuff. And, and the other thing is you can still find the barnyard on the yield maps. 30 years later, I mean, there's, there's people doing yield maps and they're going, yeah, there's, there's where that set of buildings was because there's that little square where the pasture was out behind the barn. And so what is it? And, and I'm going to say that it's, it's primarily, primarily organic matter. And uh, organic matter is the soil sponge. It, uh, it stores and releases water as it's needed. It stores and releases nitrogen and other nutrients. It prevents compaction, it reduces puddling and, soil and, and surface sealing. And it's the glue that holds soil aggregates together. If you've taken that, you know, if, if you plow that, that old sod or whatever, I mean, especially if you're doing it with the, I refer to them as a slab master plow, the, the old international uh, super cheap bottom. But, you know, it would be like a great big long string all held together with roots and everything like that. Well, part of it too is all those little crumbly soil particles, I mean, they're held together with, with this goofy looking glue. And what is that glue? The glue is, is organic matter. Well, and glomulins, and they've got all kinds of weird names, but it's essentially it's organic matter. And that was because that soil got left alone. It just got left alone and not tilled. Every time we touch soil, oh, so yeah, here's, here's, my, here's my, my take home point on this one. We, we can't buy organic matter. We earn it. And so, I mean, you can, you can buy it in the terms of soil, uh, crop residues, you can import manure and all those sorts of things, but, but there's, there's no other way you buy organic matter. You, you have to manage for it, you have to literally earn it. So, how do we do it? And how do, and how do we increase soil health? And I'm a firm believer that the least amount of tillage possible is, is the best. And that is because so, every time you hit soil with something, every time you turn it over, every time you disturb it, you oxidize the organic matter out of it. So it's a little bit like steel in a car. Every time you scratch the paint off the steel in a car, the iron that's in the steel starts to oxidize. That's when we get rust. So we all of a sudden you get flaky, flaky rust and the rest of it goes off as carbon dioxide into, into the atmosphere. Same thing, with, uh, um, same thing with soil. Every time you basically disturb it or move it or invert it or do whatever you got to do to or going to do to soil, you lose some organic matter. You break it down. And so the soil organic, and I, and I still refer to soil organic matter as the holy grail. I mean, if, it, it's, it's, if you have it, you're just, you got, you got the greatest wonder there ever is. And if you don't, you got something that's pretty hard. As best we can, one of my other things is, is, undis, is an undisturbed surface. You leave all those wormholes and fissures and pores and cracks and everything that develop uh, as, as, a, as a soil, uh, uh, heals itself, I guess, after long-term tillage. Um, 
we strip till. I'll show you some pictures here in a second. Uh, and it is a compromise. Uh, so we gave up the plow, you know, 25 years ago, and we've and we've tried to get away from full width tillage. I'm not a big fan of vertical tillage. In other words, all these what I refer to as fancy discs. So you're still disturbing the entire soil surface. And so even though it's you know, and, and that's better than plow. I'm, you know, I'm not trying to upset you. You know, only hitting something two inches deep is way better. But it's uh, um, if, if the more of the soil surface we can leave, completely leave undisturbed the better, in my opinion. And so ver uh, strips is a compromise. Um, I still say that vertical tillage is a little bit like lighter mild cigarettes, but it's still cigarettes. Um, no residue removal, period. And so again, that carbon that's in, the is, that's in the residue, every time you cart that off the field, I mean, you're basically exporting the organic matter. You're exporting the thing that is going to make that soil really sexy and cool. And uh, so, as much soil organic matter as you can, you know, grow or, or at least not export, the better. Um, one of the most important labs or one of the most telling labs I ever did when I was going to, to Guelph was we did a, and it, granted it was a simulation, but still we looked at continuous corn and everybody knows how much residue there is from corn and everybody thinks, oh man, if you, if you got corn, you're, you're just adding so much organic matter. And you are. Except if you mold board plow and two tillage passes, you oxidize more organic matter than you put down. And so you're, you're going backwards, even on continuous corn. Then you throw in edible beans or soys or peas or something that has really crappy organic matter in, into your crop sequence, and you're going back faster. And, and for all the people that are sitting there going, Ken, you are so full of crap. You know, continuous corn is a good thing. You know, it'll build a soil. Okay. Well then, all those farms that we, we broke out of grass or whatever in the late 60s, early 70s and did about 30 years of continuous corn on, why then can you still find the fence bottom or the pasture in those farms? And, and that ground is always darker. In other words, organic matter has more organic matter than the place where you've done 30 years of continuous corn. That's because you went backwards, even on continuous corn. So. It's not the corn that's the bad thing, it was the tillage that we used at the time to grow continuous corn. So, avoid compaction. Compaction is often identified as the number one yield limiting factor. I mean, we're all looking, you know, we're looking to buy seeds that give us the magic wand and, and all these technologies and all this sort of stuff. And really a lot of things are just what's under our feet and, and how we treat things. Um, and, and we have to avoid compaction regardless of tillage type. I know there's some guys on some sands and they think, ah, oh, no, I can, you know, I can go out and I can get away with sort of, whoops, get away with some of this stuff. Um, actually sands with a little bit of tillage and, uh, you know, where you sort the sand, you put all the, the, the fine, fine sand particles down about seven inches deep. Actually, you can get uh, some pretty tight stuff on sands. Uh, so it's regardless of tillage type, regardless of soil type, and, and the thing is it's long lasting, it's not fixable. I mean you drive something, you drive a manure tanker across something on the wrong day, I mean, and that down deep, that's there a long time. So it takes mindset, it takes uh, equipment, and it takes patience. So at least in our situation, uh, uh, I threw a set of tracks under a cart about 10 years ago. Neighbor came in, looked at them and looked at my piece of shit $1,500 pickup truck sitting out front in the yard and he looks at the pickup and looks at the track system he says, how much you spend on those tracks, Ken? And I said, oh, about 23,000 bucks. He says, that would have bought a nice pickup truck. And I said, yeah, I said, but the pickup truck has a sucking sound in this operation. It'll never make me a penny. And those things will make me a penny or make me money every year, every time. That's why I invest in stuff like this and still drive a piece of crap pickup truck. Um, Again, the, that, that set up there, so that's basically Michelin radials all the way around that combine, uh, 15 PSI, uh, and that's with the big bin extension, the big funnel, as I call it, up on the top there. You know, it's got one of those big satellite dish laid out on their side things. Uh, and uh, so the rears and the fronts, uh, I think that cost us around 7,000 bucks when the combine was new, but I think it probably made us money every day we went to the field. So 15 PSI or less, that was what our target was for, uh, for any tire that was in a field. And that's what we're on now. So again, we went to tracks again. And uh, you know, they're uh, probably, if it's a brand new machine, I think it's around a $40,000 option for tracks and, and the pusher axle. But still, it's, it's, it's an investment. 
that you make to basically uh, keep your soil going. Uh, that's not me driving because the auger's out and we've had that discussion with the guy. <laughs> <laughs> Only one tree so far. <laughs> Anyhow, cover crops. Uh, so Woody pretty well covered this, but the reason we're into cover crops is there's more organic matter. Um, so anytime you can sequester or you know basically grow or more organic matter in a time where you're not growing a crop, it's a good thing. And anytime you can put more living roots and shoots for worms in a soil, it's a good thing. And anytime, oh, and by the way, part of the reason we grow cover crops is to actually aid residue breakdown. So you take a really good cover, especially after wheat. Like as for example, you go out and harvest wheat, spray it with Roundup a week later, and then go out later on in the year, you know, and hit it with Roundup again. The following spring, that wheat stuff will be standing there just as proud as all get out, and it'll be hard and it'll be chewy. And if we had a really good crop of clover or a really good cover crop that grew up about knee high and nice and lush and green, it's amazing how much of that stubble disappears underneath that canopy. And essentially what you're doing is you're, it's a cover, so it's like a canopy crop, you, but you give cover for something to live in and all those bugs and everything will work really, really hard under that cover and break that residue down. So part of the reason we use covers is not only to sequester nutrients on manure and stuff, which is my last point, but it really, really helps break down residues. So a healthy soil has faster water infiltration, has water availability in dry periods, has equipment carrying capacity, the, the residue decomposes on it really, really fast, and big, 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 here's, here's the reason, more stable yields. I might not hit the top every time, but by golly, when the crap hits the fan, uh, we usually pull a pretty decent yield out just simply because we have a soil that is resilient and, and, uh, and will support yield, support stuff. So this is, my, this is my only compromise. So we're basically, we know till corn, so we're, we're corn soybean wheat rotation. We have some dry beans in there too, but essentially uh, uh, this is our only tillage implement. I don't own a plow cultivator or disc anymore. Um, but this is our strip till rig and uh, this is a fur cart, basically the bottom end of it is a Montag, so, uh, and they're pretty popular as far as putting fertilizer on anymore. Uh, that's a picture of it working. That's not wet actually, that was one morning after a really, really heavy dew, so things were just a little bit sticky, but that, that strip we were making was just god awful gorgeous mellow. Uh, that is, this is the following spring, so that's, that's the corn planted on, on those strips the following spring. So essentially, you know, we just got that eight or ten inches there where the where the corn's going in. There's no residue there to, you know, you know, deal with slugs or all those other nasty things that everybody worries about. And basically, this zone here, I mean, it's beautiful cover. Um, all the worm holes are still intact. I mean, water runs through there just like, I mean, water infiltration is just incredibly great on that. And um, you got all that cover there as well for uh, to, to absorb the impact of rain and, uh, and all that sort of neat stuff. Question there, Ken. Is that any spring stripping or is that cold on the planter or is that tractor burn? Okay, so basically that's that. That's this. This is fall. This is what's left in the spring after the planter. Okay, all this, all the planter has, all my planter has, is a set of trash whippers, uh, Keaton seed firmer, and. Um, I run a, a Dawn closing system, so two curved tying wheels. Um, so it, you know, there's no colders. It's not a, actually it's not a heavy planter at all. It's a really really light planter. It's just a Kinsey Econofold. Um, yeah, we don't even have a fertilizer colder on it because we're dropping. Uh, so all our P and K goes down with the in the band in the fall, and then we're just dropping 10 to 15 gallons, 28 percent out behind the closing wheel uh, with the planter to get the corn started. Just so I'll give you a couple of pictures. So, so, uh, so this is actually azuki beans in 30s on fall made strips after wheat. But the thing I really wanted to illustrate is in between here. So three years ago, that field was about 180 some odd bushel crop of corn. The year later is a 61 bushel crop of soybeans. Didn't get any wheat in that fall, but the following, week, the following spring we planted spring wheat. Got 68 bushel of spring wheat. Whoops. Where's all the residue? There was, there was no tillage. There was no tillage other than the strip till pass and the wheat stubble before we planted the beans. Where's all the residue? We didn't take any off, but you get a soil rocking and rolling and it takes down residue to be hell. There's looking down the field. That's pretty nice. I can live with that. 
That's about canopy closure. And I actually know the picture's a little bit goofy on that. So that's just before we desiccated them. But you know, yeah, there's the odd weed. So other than the soil applied herbicide we put on in the spring, no insecticide, no fungicide for white mold, uh, 24 bags um, at 50 cents a pound. And uh, we're pretty happy with that. Yeah. Yes, sir. No, so yeah, so as far as soys, yeah, we're still, we still inoculate our soys. Um, th that edible bean there, I think we put 45 pounds of N on at planting. So here's my parting thought. It took us 30 or 40 years of tillage, tight rotations, uh, rotations including a lot of soybeans and edible beans, or cheating uh, on soil conditions to get to this point. We're not going to turn this ship around in six months or six years. But if we don't stop the degradation through tillage, residue removal, and compaction, it will never get better. And that's all I have to say. <laughs>